Graphics. The visual message they convey are quickly becoming the primary style of communication around the world. When the Amiga was first introduced in 1985, it was the amazing palette of colors and screen resolution, combined with the low price tag, that made the computer so desirable. Over the past five years, the Amiga has continued to develop, with expansion into other areas besides graphics. Yet it is the graphics capability that sets the Amiga aside as a unique and powerful computing tool. Today the Amiga is actively used by thousands of people involved in graphics or commercial art. Amiga graphics are used in motion pictures, television, for advertising, in personal desktop videos, music videos, and in education. This video will explain the basics of graphics design, provide some valuable input on how to select colors, fonts, and software. We will assume that you're already familiar with the operation of your Amiga, its user manuals, the workbench, CLI, and peripheral hardware. If you aren't, we suggest you take a look at Getting Started with Your Amiga, a videotape available from IDG Amiga World. For many people, graphics have been a part of their lives longer than computers. Elliot Harmon is a graphics designer who specializes in logos and brochures. Today, much of what he does involves using the computer, including both graphics and typography. He's been an active computer user for the past several years, but he values his graphics background. As far as graphics and the computer goes, I think first you need a foundation in how to use a computer, the technical aspect of it. Um, then from there, you really need a found, you need you need a foundation, a graphics foundation, in order to work with the computer and accomplish good things as far as graphics is concerned. And from there, after you learn the basics, then you can go ahead and be as creative as you possibly can be. A computer image is visible to the eye via a computer monitor. These monitors rely on their screen resolution to reproduce the image faithfully. This means that the quality of the picture depends to a certain degree on the level of resolution. Resolution is a combination of vertical and horizontal dots, or pixels, on the display. The Amiga is able to reproduce a variety of screen resolutions. The Amiga supports low, medium, interlace, and high resolution modes. In low resolution, the Amiga has 320 pixels horizontally and 200 pixels vertically. In low resolution mode, if you draw a line diagonally, you'll easily see the low level of resolution. The line will not be straight, but will look jagged. Some people refer to this resolution problem as the jaggies or stair-stepping, since the line appears to be like a series of stairs. Other resolutions include medium resolution, 640 by 200, Interlace resolution, 320 by 400, and high resolution, 640 by 400. Drawing a line diagonally while in the high resolution mode will produce quite different results. The line will appear to be almost straight. Resolution is important, and then again, it's not important. It's important if you have to really fine tune some items, and you have to see every bit of detail. but. The computer can be used in many different ways. It can be used as a, as a finished tool where you produce a very finished item or it can be used as a uh, rough drafting tool where you produce only a concept and then the viewer has to have a certain amount of imagination as to crispness and how the final product will look. Overscan allows you to display information using the entire screen of the display. Most computer displays use a non-overscan display that uses the central portion of the screen. The outer edges are left blank. In the past, many monitors had some degree of curvature to the front of the display. As you get to the outside edges, the images tended to distort due to the curvature of the screen. Actually, most monitors made these days have very accurate screens with little distortion, but non-overscan is still widely used. Overscan is important when creating animations or graphic images for use on videotape. A video monitor will use the entire display area, so a computer image overlaid without overscan may not look right. As you might guess, overscan adds still more resolution to an image and also takes up more memory in your Amiga. However, the results are usually worth it. 
There are several different levels of overscan available, depending on which computer software program you're using. The standard high-resolution overscan mode provides 768 by 480 pixels on screen. The level of resolution also affects the palette and the number of available colors you may use when creating an image. For example, in low resolution mode, you may use up to 64 colors, while in high resolution mode, you will typically be limited to 16 colors. The colors you use will have a tremendous effect on the final image you reproduce. In low resolution modes, you'll be able to use more blending of colors and shading. As a result, your image may appear as though it has a higher screen resolution than it actually does. We'll discuss how to select a resolution mode later on. The Amiga also supports another mode called Interlace. This mode is useful when working with video projects. The Amiga has found excellent success in video arenas as a result of its ability to easily support the same output as television. Interlace, simply put, is the ability to display a series of information on the screen in two segments. Half of the information, broken out into every other horizontal line, is displayed every 30th of a second, while the other half is displayed every other 30th of a second. It's easy to see the effect of interlace on your Amiga, while in one of the higher resolution modes, display highly contrasting colors, and you'll see the interlace flicker. The Amiga is a versatile and powerful graphics system with a large variety of software and hardware tools available to make the task of graphics generation flexible and challenging. Choosing the correct tools is just as important as selecting the right computer. Prior to making a judgment about which product may be the best for your use, let's take a moment and decide what type of graphics you'll be working with. Computer art is often completely different than other types of art mediums. The computer allows you to combine mediums, such as a brush, spray can, or a pencil. As a result, the options available to the computer artist are exceptional. Howard Idelson is a graphic designer based in Santa Monica, California. During the past several years, he has developed a highly successful style, based in large part on using computers to create and manipulate his images. I think that somebody just seeing an Amiga for the first time who was interested in getting into art might see a lot of uh, opportunities. Um, I think someone who's been in art might see it as a different thing, maybe as a, as a more uh, extensive tool. In someone who wanted to become an artist, I think it might blow their mind. <laughs> The first step to master, regardless of which program you use, is the mouse. In its simplest form, the mouse is a point-and-click device for selecting various options, while the keyboard is used to input most of the data into the computer. For graphics use, this system will usually work in reverse. The keyboard and function keys will be used to select tools and options, while the mouse will be the primary form of data input into the Amiga. The Amiga mouse is one of the best-built mechanical mouses around. Even so, it's a good idea to get a mouse pad for supporting the mouse. There are two reasons for this. First of all, the pad will help keep the mouse clean and free of dirt and lint. Secondly, the mouse pad is similar in shape to a monitor, so it serves as a good working guide, even though you will use an area larger than the mouse pad. I think using a mouse is, is something that comes really very fast to most people. Um, you might equate it with the little paddle ball that you have to hit on the board back and forth. You hit it a few times and it bounces all over the place, but you do it a while and you get the practice, you get the hang of it. It's just like anything else. Practice moving the mouse while looking at the screen. Try four types of operations, including vertical movements, horizontal movements, circles, and handwriting. And when you try to write your name on the screen, you'll see firsthand how different the mouse is from a pen or a pencil. Once you get the hang of it, though, you'll be able to combine a variety of artist tools into one medium. As an artist, you're doing, always doing hand-eye coordination type stuff, so picking up a mouse is, is a pretty natural thing. I mean, just you're, you're watching what you're doing on the screen with your hand. It just carries over pretty naturally.
The computer monitor is a viewing device for your work. Usually, you'll display your finished work using either the monitor, videotape, or some form of printed output, like a printer or plotter. When creating an image, the monitor is more than just canvas. It becomes as much a tool as any artist's brush. You can create art that is larger than the screen, zoom into or away from the work you're creating, and adjust the overall display to suit your personal taste. It's easy to start creating your own graphics using a basic Amiga 500 computer, a color monitor, and a single disk drive. If you're planning on studying the art of graphics seriously, then you should consider some hardware options as well. The most important items to have on hand include an external floppy drive and at least one megabyte of memory. It's important to note that the more memory you have, the better off you'll be when creating graphics and animations. Most professional graphic artists use between five and eight megabytes of RAM. A hard disk is another excellent option to consider. With a hard disk, you can access a number of programs and data without constantly changing disks. Deluxe Paint 3 has long been considered the industry standard for Amiga artists. Electronic arts designer Dan Silva has devoted years of his life creating a tool that allows you to paint, create, and animate in a single software package. Several years ago, this type of power would have had a price tag of thousands of dollars attached to it. But Deluxe Paint 3 is available well below $200. The latest version of Deluxe Paint is called D-Paint 3. This version includes the ability to paint in the overscan mode, tinting, and inclusion of half-bright to an image. Half-bright adds half-intensity to each color, giving you a usable palette of 64 colors. There are a number of other improvements, including some sophisticated animation tools. D-Paint 3 allows you to create a series of images or frames and then play them back in a loop. There are a series of tools that allow you to edit, insert, or delete frames, and you have extensive control over the movement of images, or as D-Paint calls them, brushes. We'll take a closer look at D-Paint a bit later. As this program is graphics oriented, we'll discuss the powerful animation features in another video. DigiPaint 3 from NewTek is designed to work with the Amiga's Hold and Modify, or HAM, color mode. This allows you to work with all 4,096 colors at the same time. As you can see, the results are tremendous. DigiPaint also includes a highly sophisticated system for mixing different color pixels to create transitions of color. This system is called dithering, and DigiPaint's system is one of the more popular for creating colorful backgrounds and images. A HAM paint program becomes most valuable when working with digitized images like these. We'll talk a bit more about digitizing later. Another interesting feature that sets DigiPaint apart from other systems is its dashboard tools palette. A lot of thought and care was put into this artist's system, so creating an image is simple and direct. DigiPaint also includes a separate support program called Transfer 24. This program allows detailed control over the brightness, color saturation, hue, and resolution of any image. The program will also save your work in any graphics mode, allowing compatibility with all popular Amiga graphics software. There are also a number of other paint programs available, including Chroma Paint, Photon Paint, Express Paint, Aegis Images, and MyPaint. As we've mentioned, the Hold and Modify, or HAM, mode of the Amiga allows for concurrent display of all 4,096 colors. Although at first, HAM sounds like the way to go, you should note that HAM paint programs have certain limitations. These include the inability to always transfer the images they produce into other programs without losing the HAM palette. Usually, a HAM image saved into a 32-color low-resolution picture will not look as realistic as you'd like. Another factor to consider is the HAM mode creates images that take up lots of memory and disk space. If you're creating an original piece of work, you probably won't require the use of a HAM paint program. However, if you are working with any type of digitized image or touching up a background for a high-quality animation piece, then using a HAM program will prove to be quite useful. Keep in mind that selecting a paint program is similar to selecting the tools found in an artist's workshop. 
Most paint programs include a wide variety of artist tools. The difference between a standard paint program and a ham program might more accurately be compared to the different art mediums available, such as airbrush versus watercolor. Most accomplished artists will have the capability of creating both styles of work. For this section on creating an image, we'll use Deluxe Paint 3 from Electronic Arts. This product has continued to evolve with the Amiga and is considered the standard paint program for artists and graphics use. Please note that many of the operations we will introduce you to are similar to those found in other paint programs. So if you're interested in using a program other than Deluxe Paint 3, this section will still prove valuable to you. Make sure the computer is turned on and your monitor is adjusted. Prior to using the program, make sure you've created backup copies of your master disks. Refer to your user guide for instructions on making backups. Insert the D-Paint 3 disk into the DF0 disk drive and a blank formatted disk into the DF1 disk drive. The workbench will load and you'll see the D-Paint 3 icon on the desktop. Double click the left button of the mouse on the icon and the program will load. The first requester you will see asks you to select a screen resolution, color palette, and a few other options. Since this is the first time the program is being used, let's select low res, 32 colors, and leave the other options, including overscan, alone. The next screen you see is the deluxe paint screen. This screen includes a title bar, a toolbox, color palette, and a painting area called the page. The page is usually the same size as the window, but can be increased to be much larger. The title bar will report information to you as you're using D-Paint, including which brush you're using, which mode you're in, and the coordinates of the mouse on the page. Deluxe Paint has a series of menus like most other Amiga programs. Position the mouse over the title bar and depress the right mouse button. The menus will appear. Position the mouse over any of the menu titles and the menu will open. Releasing the mouse button over any of the options or sub-options will select that option for use. The toolbox includes a number of useful tools for creating artwork. Moving from top to bottom, there are a number of built-in brushes similar to the brushes you would use when painting with oils or watercolors, continuous freehand or dotted freehand painting tools, lines including straight and curved, a fill tool for adding a color or range of colors to an enclosed area, an airbrush, a number of object shapes including circles, rectangles, ellipses, and polygons. Note that the objects can be selected either as filled or unfilled objects. You can also select a screen brush or work with text, which we'll do in a few moments. If you're working with commercial art or creating a double-sided object, you may want to use a grid or select the symmetry tool. For detail work, you can magnify or zoom out from your art. Finally, you can undo your last painting action or clear the entire screen. Below the toolbox, you'll see a dot. This represents the currently selected foreground color. The area behind the dot is the currently selected background color. Underneath the selected colors is the palette. The number of colors available will depend on the screen format selected. Refer to your user guide for further information on formats and color options. Okay, we've loaded the program and covered the basic working tools. Now, let's start painting. Let's create a pop art image using some bold colors and shapes. Begin by positioning the mouse cursor over the red in the palette and clicking the left mouse button once. Notice the dot above the palette turned red. Now let's select a brush. Position the cursor over the largest round brush and click the left button once. Now move the cursor to the middle of the screen. Make a squiggly line like this by pressing the left mouse button and holding it for as long as you want to paint. Now move a little bit to the left and below the first squiggle and make another one. Now let's change the brush and the color. Let's select the medium square brush and the color yellow. Now repeat the squiggly line routine inside the already created red squiggles. Notice the shape of the line and that it easily fits inside the larger red squiggles. Next, let's keep the same brush but grab a third color, in this case light blue, and create a few more squiggles. Okay, we've just created a colorful bunch of lines. Now let's do something with them. Select the screen brush tool. Notice a horizontal and vertical grid appear on the page. 
Position the lines to the left and above the squiggles that you've created. And while holding the left mouse button, drag the cursor to the right and below the squiggles so that you've made a rectangle around the art. When you release the mouse button, you'll see a duplicate of the lines you've made. This is a screen brush. You're now able to paint with this brush. Click the left mouse button a few times and you'll see the potential for using brushes. You'll also notice that suddenly your art appears more interesting. Before we move on to the next step, press the left mouse button down and drag the brush a bit like this. The result is really powerful. Let's click a few more times and move on to the next step. Select a square brush and the color gray. Now select the unfilled rectangle tool and create a frame around your art. Select dark blue and make a small filled rectangle. Let's select another color and make another filled rectangle. Now select the line tool and the color green. Create a line between the two rectangles. Okay, so green doesn't work all that great in this image. So let's get rid of the line. Click the left button over the undo button in the toolbox and the line disappears. Let's redo the line with the largest round brush in white. Better. Now let's add a few more lines. There are two ways to do this. First of all, you can draw as many lines as you wish. Another method is to use the symmetry tool. Select it and watch what happens. You'll see a series of points in a circular shape appear on the screen. And as you move the mouse, the points will move closer together or further apart. When you press the left mouse button, you'll be painting. Releasing the button will complete the image. Let's add some airbrush effects to the piece. Select the airbrush tool. Also, select the dotted brush and the color yellow. Now, press the left mouse button a few times and create some airbrush sections like this. We've talked a bit about palettes and combining colors, so let's add a few special effects before we complete our image. First of all, let's create a gradient filled circle. A gradient fill is made up of a range of colors selected in the D-Paint palette menu. Okay, we'll select the fill type requester by clicking on the fill circle tool. Select vertical fill. Now we'll add some dithering. Dithering controls the degree of color mixing for gradient fills. The more you slide the dithering gadget to the right, the more color mixing there'll be. For this fill, we'll use a range of grays from the palette. Notice the preview of the dithering selected below the gadget in the requester. You'll see a vertical and horizontal grid on the screen. And as you press the left mouse button, a dithered gradient circle will appear. Create several of these circles. Once you get the hang of gradient fills, you'll be able to use the effect for dimensioning and perspective. Refer to your user guide for more information on palette mixing. Look at that screen. You should already feel like a computer artist. Now let's blend some of the colors in the dithered circle. Using the pull down menu, select blend. Now select a medium round brush. Now carefully move the brush while painting with the left mouse button. You'll see the colors blend immediately. So there's your first image. If you want to see it without the toolbox and title bar, press the F10 key on your keyboard. To get the toolbox and title bar back, press F10 again. Move the cursor up to the title bar. Select the picture menu and the save option. A requester will appear. The requester will ask you to specify a disk drive to save your image to. Let's select DF1 by clicking the left mouse button while the cursor is positioned over the DF1 button. Now, click the mouse button once in the edit field next to the word file. Type in first image and select save. You've done it. Created and saved your first piece of art. Fonts, or more commonly, typeface, refers to the characters used in creating titles and copy in graphic art. Type is a major element in design. Often the viewer will react to the typeface or font before considering the rest of the image. Fonts, to me, give whatever you're working on its personality. I mean, if it involves words, the font is that word's personality. You, what, whatever you're trying to express, fun, seriousness, you know, tragedy, comedy. Type styles themselves can be a picture and can have a personality. A word can have its own personality, its own feeling. You, read, you can read the same word with, in two different fonts and get completely different ideas from that.
certain typefaces have over the years come to be established for their combination of consistency and adaptability. Some of these fonts include the Helvetica family for modern styles and the Roman family for more traditional pieces. The Helvetica family is considered a sans serif font because there aren't any terminating strokes on the ends of each letter as there are with Roman style fonts. Take a look at the basic differences between the two. When considering a font for a project, it's a good idea to get an overall feel for the importance of the image to be created. Are you creating an ad, a logo, or a newsletter? Well, when you select a typeface, you can't get the character of a typeface from one letter, or two letters, or three letters. Generally, it takes several words. And within those several words, there has to be generally a certain combination of, of letters. Um, each typeface has its own characteristics, and some letters portray that typeface's characteristics more so than do other letters or other letter combinations. So the more you have, the better. Um, if you have several paragraphs, you can see the color on the page. If you have several words, you can see the color and the character of that letter face, but you can't do it very well with only a few letters. It is possible to mix a number of fonts, but be careful. Too many fonts will clutter your work and make the project confusing and unattractive. It is possible to create a wild look as a special effect with a number of fonts, but usually you'll want to limit your use of fonts to two or three carefully selected font families. You can mix serif and sans serif fonts. Usually an artist will select a serif font to complement a sans serif font. Take a look at this example of a sans serif and a serif font complementing each other in this image. Deluxe Paint 3 has an excellent font requester that allows you to see the name and size availability for each font on the selected disk. You can also display each font prior to using it. This is very important when selecting fonts. There are also a wide variety of fonts available for use with the Amiga. Many of these fonts are available from Kara Fonts. The different styles and faces are well designed and are usable in a wide variety of applications. Check with your Amiga dealer for information on the latest font releases. Often, the words you use to convey a message will have more impact on your audience than the graphics that accompany them. It's important to take time to make sure your text is easily understandable and conveys the proper message. When you want to select a typeface, one of the first things you have to think about is what are you trying to portray in your artwork and how are you trying to portray it? Do you want a classy effect? Do you want to shout? Do you want to whisper? Do you want to hit someone over the head? So all of those things help to get across the idea of what it, whatever it is you're trying to create. There are a number of elements to successful titling using a personal computer. These elements include color, font family, style, composition, and clarity. Each component has an equal value to the final result. Therefore, it is possible to pick the right font, size, and layout and still ruin the final product by choosing the wrong color. The most important thing to remember when titling is to make sure the text is readable. Use clean fonts and don't add special effects unless they play an important role in the final look of the image. One of the benefits of using a personal computer is the ease in which you can modify or experiment with fonts. Typefaces have evolved over the years specifically as a result of their ability to communicate specific visual and emotional qualities. There are a number of established historical typefaces that are used to depict traditional settings. More modern typefaces often reflect the social climate and trends. Taking one of these typefaces and manipulating them further is a direct reflection of the evolution of style. As you begin creating titles, you will have a number of things to consider, including font style, color, size, and positioning. A simple titling package to use is TV Text from the Zuma Group. This package is perfect for getting titles up and running easily. Make your moves one step at a time and you won't get overloaded. I think color is of negligible importance to type. It is to overall design and type 
will be part of that overall design, but black and white is really what type is about. Color is what design is about. Type is a part of design. Aegis Video Titler is an excellent advanced font product that gives you a wide range of options when creating presentation or title screens. One of the product's benefits is the ability to quickly and easily manipulate the visual appearance of the typeface selected. It's easy to create drop shadows, glows, and other effects. Clip art is a series of images that reflects a specific style, including backgrounds, cityscapes, vehicles, animals, and so on. Each image is usually treated as a deluxe paint brush, and so may be imported into almost any program. Clip art has changed. The connotation of clip art over the years has changed. There really are quite a few sophisticated computer programs that contain numerous types of clip art that are can be very important and you can also take parts, bits and pieces of the clip art and you can make something entirely new. Clip art is just another one of the pieces of the puzzle it takes to assemble a good piece of art, uh, complete the package. If you are going to be creating a lot of graphic images, it might be a good idea to create your own clip art. The process is simple. As you create a new graphic, note any new characters or images that you might want to keep. Keep a few clip art discs handy just for this occasion. And when you want to save an image, clip it from the screen by making it a screen brush. Then save it as a brush onto one of your clip art discs. Later, when you're not working on an image, you can organize the various clip brushes into groups. Digitizing, or capture of images, is one of the most exciting capabilities for graphics production. Basically, digitizing involves capturing an image in real life and inputting an accurate representation of it into the computer. There are two basic styles of digitizing in use with the Amiga. These include photographing an image and capturing a video picture. Both are useful and can provide you with tremendous graphics power. A digitizer, such as the DigiView from NewTek, is excellent for taking a picture and creating a computer version of it. DigiView will allow you to capture images using all 4096 colors of the Amiga in its highest resolution mode. And as you can see, the results are excellent. If you're using a digitizer, there are a few things to be aware of. First of all, placing the lights too close to the image will create a glare and eliminate detail on the picture you want to capture. Try to position the lights high above the image so an even cast of light is produced. Also, don't use bulbs that create colored tints. Often a grow bulb is a good idea as it produces a smooth white light. You can get grow bulbs at any hardware store. Another solution is the use of neon bulbs. It's important not to bump or move the stand or camera while digitizing an image. If you do smack the stand by accident, review the results carefully and repeat the digitization process if necessary to ensure a quality image. The ability to digitize an image into a computer and play with fonts with it and, and uh, different pieces of clip art enables you to instantly see how something is going to be created rather than doing constant overlays and going running to the Xerox machine and you know assembling things mechanically and, and it just kind of speeds up the whole process of, of putting together a piece of art. Another method of creating a computer version of a real-life image is through video digitizing. Instead of photographing a still object or photograph, a video digitizer is capturing a frame of videotape and inputting the information into the computer. So if you want to work with an image that you can't get to personally, you may be able to acquire a videotape and capture the image that way. Progressive Peripherals makes an excellent digitizer for capturing existing videotape. Regardless of which style of digitizing you use, you'll find that a ham paint program will prove invaluable when tinting or touching up a digitized image prior to use. We'll talk a bit more about using digitized images a bit later.
Along with viewing the results of your work on the screen of your monitor, there are other methods of communicating your graphic image. The most common output devices include printers, plotters, and videotape. Printers are used for output of text and graphics. There are dot matrix printers, inkjet printers, and laser printers. Today it's possible to get excellent text output from a dot matrix printer. You can also get interesting results from printing graphics. If you want to generate high quality output, then you'll probably require the use of a laser printer. There are a wide range of laser printers available these days, with the quality improving rapidly as each new model is released. Because the Amiga is capable of creating such magnificent images, many people use videotape as a means of communicating their work. As we discussed earlier, the Amiga is capable of interlaced display and output, so it is a perfect vehicle for creating video art and animation. The most important purpose for creating a graphic image is the message it will communicate. In order for the message to be effective, it must combine the right combination of graphic elements in a well thought out format. These elements include text, color, and imagery. When combined together, these elements work together. This combination is often referred to as style. Well, I think everybody has their own opinion of style. My opinion of style is something totally different than the next guy's opinion of style. When an artist develops some repetition in his creativity, that constitutes style. I think you can communicate style with a single letter or a whole picture. I don't think it really matters as long as you're the one doing the creating and you have the style within you. In order to communicate effectively, it's important to look at some of the influential works of other artists that have proven successful over the years. Although there are no hard and fast rules about style, there are established conventions in combining elements in a deliberate manner to achieve a particular style, and in turn to communicate a graphic message to the viewer. The first thing to consider when creating a project is the shape, size, and format of the image to be. The shape will provide a theme for the image. The size will determine the impact the image has on its audience. The format relates to the style of the image, whether traditional or modern. To come up with an idea usually involves sketching or doodling on paper. Or many times, just before I go to bed, I'll design something in my mind. I'll create the concept, I'll, I'll actually draw something in my mind and then I'll come back to work the next day and I'll sketch it on paper. Almost always I'll at least scribble out some roughs on a napkin on, my, on the back of my hand, wherever, before I start putting ideas into the computer. I can't just sit down and, and start creating on the screen. I think everybody has their own different way of doing it, but this is the way that seems to work best for me. Colors reflect the mood of an image. The suggestive power of color has a tremendous amount of impact on the overall effectiveness of an image. Each color has a distinctive message and should be carefully reviewed prior to use. There are passive colors, such as peach, gray, and most pastel shades, aggressive colors, including red and yellow, and suggestive colors, including green and blue. Let's take a look at a screen and manipulate the image with a variety of single colors to further explain the value of color. This image is displaying a white center and a light blue pastel tint. The result is a delicate, soft look. By the way, the use of white does not constitute a second color. Free space is always white, like paper, and so white is considered, for the most part, a non-color. If we use a combination of dark colors, such as these shades of green, the image looks determined and authoritative. At the same time, it isn't too bold. It's important to note that these images all use a single color. A variety of tints or shades of that color, but just one color. Artists often refer to tints in percentages. You may wish to use a variety of patterns to further enhance the quality of an image. The use of black and white and one additional color is very important and it does have its place. Uh, many times a client does not have a budget that allows you to use four color or even 
black in two additional colors. So the challenge is to make it look fresh and exciting. And actually, with one color or one color in addition to black, you can use various screens and tints, and you can have an additional six, seven other colors by combining two screens of black, let's say a 20 black and a 20 red, or a solid black and a solid red, or a 20 black and a solid red. There are many ways you can expand the palette or the visual appearance of the palette by using screens and black and one additional color. These colors represent the shades you would get if mixing colored pigment, such as a painter might do. This is not the spectrum you would get if mixing colored light. Let's spend a moment discussing colored light. Light contains all of the colors in the rainbow spectrum. These colors can be broken down into three primary colors, red, green, and blue. You may have heard these colors referred to as primary colors or RGB colors, as in your RGB monitor. If you project these three colors on top of each other, you'll get a pure white, or what artists often call white light. If you remove one of the colors, a new color will be created. For example, red and blue with green removed creates magenta. Green and blue with red removed creates cyan. Red, green, and blue are called additive primaries because they combine to produce white light. Yellow, magenta, and cyan are produced by eliminating one of the additive primaries. As a result, they're called subtractive primaries. When two subtractive primaries are combined, they create an additive primary. When all three subtractive primaries are combined, they create black. In design, the use of color can represent a particular style or look, such as the time of year or a geographical location. When using computers, one of the primary values of using multiple colors is the effect on realism. A bunch of colors on the screen are, well, a bunch of colors. For example, take a look at this screen and note the palette. Now, take a look at the face of this famous leader and note the palette. As you can see, the palettes are the same, but the results are not. The right combination of colors can make the image look realistic. In order to give you a better idea about the different capabilities of color, we've created a color wheel that shows the range and effects of different colors. As we mentioned earlier, red is a bold, aggressive color, while soft tones such as light blue or light green are pleasing to the eye. You can use a chart like this to help you build a list of colors for specific types of work. And don't forget, once you've decided on a color, you can use a variety of tints from the basic color to achieve many different shades. When creating a graphic image, you may find that the best result for your own style is a range of colors for creating realistic images combined with a restrictive use of color when using fonts or graphic representations. Color is also an effective method for creating a special effect. For example, if you want to promote quality, the use of gold or marble texture is highly effective. Another method to consider is the use of no color, but rather a range of black, gray, and white. When working with digitized images, using black and white can produce a striking effect, such as this image grabbed from videotape. Black and white is very effective for recreating a past era. If you wanted to study the Civil War, you would find primarily black and white photos, ink sketches, and drawings. Black and white is also effective for use in illustration work. If you want to create a woodcut or pen and ink image, then black and white is an effective style to consider. I love black and white. I've said this before, but basically my career revolves around real estate and architecture. And there are things that you can see in black and white. You can see form and shape in black and white, to me, much better than you can in color. Black and white has the ability to stimulate your imagination a little more rather than a piece that is bombarding you with a lot of colors. And then again, I mean, the colored piece has its own place, too. But sometimes a black and white piece can cover that aspect a little better.
As we've mentioned a number of times, a combination of elements produces a finished style for any piece of graphic art. If you're working with original art, then understanding the basis of your ideas and knowing how to translate those ideas to the computer will be essential to producing an image that will please you. Don't forget to study the works of successful artists to see how their works have turned out. And feel free to experiment. Don't let your ideas get intimidated by the wrong color or effect being used. The same is true for other forms of graphic art as well. If you're creating a piece of commercial art, knowing your audience will be critical to finding the right elements and style for your work. Look at what the professionals are doing. Look at what the good designers are doing and the successful designers, not, and not just the corporate designers, the, the guys who are doing the really fun stuff too because they're the ones who are setting the trends and, and you can learn from them and develop a style of your own, but look around you and, and keep an eye on what the, the good guys are doing and try and follow along those lines. One of the common concerns about using a computer for graphics is the degree of resolution that should be used. Many people think that a computer-generated image will not have any professional quality unless there's a minimum level of resolution. Resolution is an element in creating an image. As we've discussed, colors have a dramatic effect on resolution. It's possible to create an image in low resolution that looks terrific because of the careful use of colors. Sometimes, a computer look is desired, so having big pixels becomes an important part of the image. In any event, try not to focus too much on the resolution of the image and stick with the style values and the quality of your creativity. One area where resolution is very important is when using fonts. It is important to use care when generating typefaces. A poor resolution appearance on fonts does not look professional. And if you're working with low resolution and require the use of large fonts, then use care when selecting a typeface. Usually, you will have better results if you use a sans serif font, such as Helvetica. Another important topic to consider when deciding on a style for your work is the makeup of the finished image. If you're using a paint program or a digitized image, you will be using software that generates images made up of individual points or pixels. This type of art is referred to as bitmapped art. Once you've added it to the image, it becomes a permanent part of the overall image. If you're working with detailed graphics or creating an architectural piece, then you'll want to use software that creates individual objects every time you create something. This is called a structured object image. Computer-aided design, or CAD, software allows you to create a series of objects that are individually modifiable. Additionally, you're able to work with a number of different layers, increasing the flexibility of your image. For example, you could create a floor plan, an electrical plan, a ceiling plan, and show them separately or together. Graphic artists usually use programs that generate bitmapped images, while engineers and architects often use programs that generate structured objects. We'll discuss structured objects in more detail in another video. Until the past few years, 3D graphics have not been available to users of personal computers. The Amiga market has a wide variety of 3D software packages available now, with more in development all the time. The third dimension is an important element to consider. Adding a third dimension is like adding motion to your image. True, there are many effective ways to add the effect of movement to a 2D image, but 3D, properly used, can make an image look alive. Joe Conti has been an active creator of 3D art. His Polar Arts Company has specialized in working with motion picture and commercial art firms, assisting them with their set design and camera planning. Polar Arts has also created a series of 3D clip art discs designed for use in developing ray-traced images and animation. When you work in three dimensions, you must be concerned about the width, height, and depth of an object. Further, an experienced artist working with three dimensions will always think about the back of an image. This elevates the difficulty in creating 3D art significantly. 
There is one element in using 3D art that can be accomplished in a traditional 2D package. This is the use of perspective. As things move further away from you, they will get smaller. In addition to getting smaller, the left and right edges of the landscape will seem to merge in the center of the screen. This effect is called perspective. When creating a graphic image, it is important to consider the position the viewer will be in when looking at the art. When a graphic artist is creating this positioning, it's often called the POV, or point of view. When we look at some of the work Joe Conti is responsible for, you'll see there's always a tremendous amount of attention paid to the POV and perspective. The world of graphics is an exciting one, with many diverse and unique styles. The Amiga is continually proving its ability as an excellent graphics tool for both personal and professional use. As the Amiga continues to evolve, the tools for producing sophisticated graphics will also increase in their power and flexibility. You should now have a good understanding of color and graphic style as it relates to the Amiga. Combined with your ability to digitize images, collect and create clip art, and generate original concepts, you're on your way to becoming an accomplished graphic artist. Future volumes on Amiga Graphics will continue to explain the ethics of style while also providing detailed instruction on creating specific types of computer art, including 3D, commercial art, and animation.